Um, I'm going to try and outline some of the general issues and some things that we think we know about caffeine and give you an idea of um, what some of the controversies are in, in the field as well. Um, I'm from uh, the U.S. Army Research Institute of Environmental Medicine. That is a, um, uh, a laboratory that's uh, part of the Army Medical Research and Material Command. And if we can have, and I'll get the next slide, which uh, has my uh, rather uh, detailed um, acknowledgments, and um, these are sort of uh, the standard, standard boilerplate that um, my uh, institution requires, and they uh, say that uh, we've followed all the rules, um, but um, disavow everything that we've said. Uh, I also uh, would note that I'm uh, the um, government liaison to the LC Caffeine um, Study Group, and uh, that um, LC provided support for me to come to this meeting, and um, I appreciate that. I'm going to try and address um, a series of topics. We don't have a whole lot of time, but um, we'll try and get to some key points, I hope. And um, I suspect you have already um, some interests in caffeine, so um, that's pretty clearly an important uh, topic to go into. I'll try and talk about them from a general perspective. Um, I'm going to... Um, talk a little bit about how caffeine got in the food supply in the first place. Um, they, uh, we, we get uh, caffeine from a variety um, of plants, and um, there's a question, in, uh, I think, uh, about how did it actually evolve and what's its um, purpose in the uh, place where, and in the multiple places actually where it evolved. I'll talk a little bit about caffeine, um, uh, uh, caffeine's mechanism of action in the brain. Um, I'm going to um, present some data on patterns of caffeine intake over the last decade in the United States using um, the NHANES database um, as a source of uh, the data for that discussion. And I'll talk a little bit about how the central nervous system, I think, may regulate intake of caffeine. So why is caffeine so interesting? Well. Um, it is the most widely consumed um, psychoactive substance in the United States. The only other uh, product that uh, is nearly as popular and which has clear psychoactive properties is alcohol. Caffeine is consumed by about 80% of the American adult population and alcohol by about 60% of the adult population. We know for sure that caffeine um, alters brain function um, and behavior and those effects are present in the doses um, that we consume in a variety of products, um, foods, drugs, and dietary supplements. Caffeine is naturally present in certain products. It's added to certain products as well. Um, and um, it is used to gain competitive advantage in certain foods um, by, by its presence. Uh, interestingly, it is removed from some of the same foods also to campaign uh, to gain competitive advantage, and that is to provide the consumer what they would like with regard to caffeine or, or no caffeine in often similar products. Um, it's important to remember that it is naturally present in many products, but it is added to some, that the effects are dose dependent, um, and uh, there are huge and sometimes uh, there, there is a huge and sometimes contra contradictory literature on the behavioral, physiological, and health-related effects of caffeine. And this makes um, caffeine a rather difficult product to regulate, I think, um, both from the perspective of um, what, uh, how regulators deal with it and also how public um, health officials have to deal with it. Uh, in fact, um, Speaking of regulators, the, uh, the FDA, um, as Richard had implied, has um, recently been quite interested in caffeine. And um, I'll paraphrase a couple of uh, comments that, that uh, they've made in a, in a recent paper. Um, they've noted that while patterns of caffeine-containing um, products appear to be changing, 
the implications of these changes for public health are not well understood. And in addition, they've said that um, it's commonly stated that different types of caffeinated products are substituted for each other. For example, caffeine-containing energy drinks for coffee and vice versa. But there are few data which actually um, document these assertions. And um, as I have said, caffeine has the unique property of being a food, a drug, and a dietary supplement. It's hard to think of other non-nutritive products that could that fall into that um, into all those categories. One one of the questions that uh, some recent papers may uh, provide an answer to is. Why is caffeine in the food supply? Why have plants evolved to contain caffeine in the first place? And um, this slide um, actually um, shows that there are at least um, three caffeine-containing products, three caffeine-containing plants, which seem to uh, evolve independently. So that's an example of convergent evolution in that um, the plants are not, uh, didn't have a common ancestor which had caffeine, but for reasons that um, must improve their survival, independently evolved caffeine um, in their uh, leaves and, uh, and other portions of those plants. Those are um, coffee, tea, um, and cacao. It also turns out, quite surprisingly, that um, there are small amounts of caffeine in, in citrus, in particular in, uh, in the flowers and nectar of citrus fruits. Uh, just some pictures of our typical um, caffeine-containing products. Um, tea is on the upper right. You can see um, cacao on the far left. And um, on, on the right um, is a coffee drink. The orange is there because it turns out that orange flowers and nectar, as I said, also do contain small amounts of caffeine. So um, to kind of solve the problem of why is caffeine in uh, different plants, we kind of need to talk to um, some botanists and some entomologists. And it turns out there's research to suggest that caffeine um, is a product which insects will avoid. So it's uh, quite bitter. Tastes bitter, of course, to humans too. And um, it's been shown to prevent uh, insects from consuming plants which contain um, significant amounts of caffeine. Um, and studies have actually uh, demonstrated that it um, is uh, an insect repellent in that ins insects can taste caffeine and will avoid eating those plants. Uh, caffeine also appears to have some herbicidal properties. That is, um, when the uh, leaves of caffeine-containing um, plants fall underneath the plants, they um, prevent other plants from growing there. And therefore, um, the plants that they, um, that they fell from uh, have less competition for uh, nutrients. And then perhaps what uh, is the strangest and newest uh, reason and way that uh, plants may be using caffeine is actually in low doses to attract insects and increase poll pollination. Um, a paper that appeared um, a couple of years ago um, replicated the finding that uh, caffeine was present um, in citrus plants, especially the flowers and the nectar, and then did experiments with honeybees to find out whether there are any behavioral consequences of um, having caffeine in, that, in those uh, parts of the plant. It turned out that uh, um, honeybees that were, we'll say, rewarded with uh, caffeine in, in nectar versus honeybees who got placebo nectar were more likely to return to the same place and continue uh, pollinating that plant. Um, in theory, that, that implies that um, plants uh, gain some selective advantage by having caffeine and using it in low doses to attract bees who um, remember 
the flowers um, that contain the caffeine um, more readily than they remember, if you will, the placebo uh, factors. And I think Dr. Smith, um, another speaker this morning, will have something to say about um, how caffeine affects memory in humans. Uh, some basic facts about caffeine, it's 1,3,7-trimethylxanthine. Um, it is metabolized to um, three products, um, to um, paraxanthine, theobromine, and theophylline. The primary breakdown pathway is actually to paraxanthine, and that's uh, metabolized by cytochrome P450 enzyme, in, in particular the CYP, 1A2 um, enzyme, and that occurs in the liver. Uh, in talking about caffeine, it's a good idea to um, kind of remember what um, doses of caffeine would be present in servings of various foods. Coffee has the highest concentration of caffeine. Uh, brewed coffee contains uh, more caffeine typically than instant coffee. Tea has um, much less caffeine than um, coffee has in it per, uh, per dose. Um, cola beverages have um, slightly more caffeine typically than, than tea, and they have enough caffeine to uh, have some uh, behavioral effects. Energy drinks have roughly the same amount of caffeine um, as coffee, although coffee has a broad range, and the energy drinks can have a pretty broad range of uh, caffeine depending on the brand. Um, energy, energy shots, on the other hand, those, um, those small bottles you'll see in your convenience store are um, quite concentrated with regard to the amount of caffeine. So you'll see in just a two-ounce dose the equivalent of uh, a, a large cup of coffee. Dietary supplements can also contain caffeine and vary uh, tremendously depending on uh, the particular supplement in question. Caffeine um, has a half-life in humans of about uh, four to five hours. There are a number of factors which will influence how long um, it persists in the human body. Individuals um, who are regular heavy users of cave caffeine will metabolize caffeine more rapidly using those liver enzymes and um, will have a shorter half-life. Cigarette smokers who also use um, those uh, liver enzymes to metabolize um, caffeine, use those same enzymes for uh, metabolizing some of the products um, in cigarette smoke. So um, they metabolize caffeine much more rapidly. And um, generally speaking, smokers will have higher intakes of uh, caffeine in coffee than uh, non-smoking peers. Pregnant women, particularly in the later stages of pregnancy, also are uh, slower uh, metabolizers of caffeine. So um, just to say a few things about caffeine's mechanism of action. Um, caffeine has positive effects depending on dose, not only on cognitive performance, but also physical performance. And those effects appear to be uh, attributable to blocking of adenosine receptors. Adenosine is an inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter in the brain. And um, when you uh, block the activity of an inhibitory uh, transmitter, then you will increase brain activation. And that seems to be the primary mechanism of action of caffeine, which is responsible not only for its um, effects on behavior, but it also appears the way it affects um, physical performance. There are um, multiple subtypes of adenosine receptors. The ones which appear to be um, particularly important for um, caffeine's behavioral effects are the A1, and the A2A uh, receptors. We um, have recently uh, had the opportunity to use um, a, um, a, a very powerful um, national data set called NHANES, um, which is collected, collected by the US um, CDC um, to follow the nutrition habits and the physiology and a number of other medical issues in Americans. The study is conducted every two years, and 5,000 volunteers participate. What we did was um, 
take data from 2001 to 2012, which would have been uh, a total of 30,000 adults, and look at their patterns um, of caffeine intake over that uh, 12 years of time. Caffeine was estimated um, based on 24-hour dietary recall methods, which are then um, adjusted using an NCI method, which um, changes um, a daily intake into a habitual intake. It turns out that 89% of uh, adult Americans consume some caffeine on the course, in the course of a day, and mean caffeine intake of the whole population, including caffeine and non-caffeine users, is roughly 170 to 180 milligrams per day. So that would be in the range of two uh, small cups of coffee. Um, that, uh, those findings, and I'll show you them a little, in a little bit more detail um, in the next slide, are consistent with a recent um, survey of uh, beverage caffeine intake conducted by Mitchell. Um, and that survey was based on um, assessing beverage intake, but the results of the NHANES data and the beverage um, survey actually are, are quite similar, which makes it um, pretty convincing that these numbers are, uh, are going to be reliable, are reliable. Um, so here are some numbers um, on caffeine intake in three different age groups. The, uh, the top numbers are 2001 to 2002, and the bottom numbers are 2011 to 2012. Each of those samples had 5,000 individuals in, in them, and each are representative of the U.S. population. So um, average intake um, in 2001 and 2002 was approximately 180 milligrams. Um, in 2011 and 2012, it was 172 milligrams. Not a very large change, and when you consider the fact there's always um, some variation in numbers, they're pretty darn close to identical. Um, it's interesting to note that um, the younger volunteers in the study actually um, had a little bit less caffeine consumption uh, when you go from the 2001 and 2002 data to the 2011 and 2012 data, while the older group, the 51 to 70-year-old um, consumers, actually slightly increased um, their caffeine intake over that time period. Um, in this slide, we're showing the um, caffeine that is obtained from different food products. And um, you can see on uh, the left of the slide um, the dose of caffeine that each product is providing in each of those um, six two-year blocks of time. And Clearly, coffee at the top is providing the bulk of the caffeine that American consumers take. Uh, soda and tea provide some caffeine on the order of uh, 20 or 30 um, milligrams um, per day. And energy drinks are way down at the bottom in yellow, and they provide um, very little caffeine uh, in terms of their uh, effect on the general population. When, uh, when, when we saw this data, we wondered if, um, in fact, things had even been stable going further back in time. And we looked up some survey data from 1975 and 1980. And uh, we were somewhat surprised to see that those same levels um, of caffeine intake had been present even 40 years ago. So 185 milligrams were the data from 1975, 168 from 89, and as I said, we were at 172 for 2011 and 2012. Um, this, um, I think, is, is telling us that um, there are some factors that are uh, regulating caffeine intake, and in spite of the tremendous changes that have occurred in society um, and the proliferation of various forms of uh, caffeine and proliferation of coffee, um, places to get coffee, we see this stability um, in intake. And I'm going to get back to that issue, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about cognition and, um, 
and caffeine. We know for sure that uh, caffeine affects human behavior, as I've said um, before. Um, caffeine in moderate doses improves cognitive function, um, particularly cognitive functions that require alertness. So things like vigilance, attention, reaction time, and even real-world tasks like driving can be positively affected by moderate doses of caffeine. Interestingly, uh, caffeine has effects on mood which are consistent with its effects um, on cognitive <coughs> performance. So when you uh, consume moderate amounts of caffeine, you will feel more alert, you'll feel more vigor as measured by self-report questionnaires, and fatigue decreases. And it seems, in fact, that caffeine's most uh, positive effects are in a moderate dose range. Of course, a moderate dose range can vary a lot depending on the individual in question. So the extent of your regular caffeine intake, um, your individual differences in caffeine metabolism, and your uh, genetic makeup will um, determine to a large extent um, where in that dose response function you fall and what the optimal dose of caffeine is going to be for you. And, um, we believe that uh, individuals are actually pretty good at sensing that and titrating it so that um, they maintain, if you will, their optimal um, cognitive state based on their um, learned patterns of caffeine intake. These um, four slides actually show um, that um, U-shaped function for the effects of caffeine on mood. So. Um, you can see how um, at various doses of caffeine ranging from uh, 36, uh, 128 to 256 across that uh, plot that the, the peak positive effects on mood are around 128 milligrams of caffeine. Um, at higher or lower uh, levels of caffeine, the effects are still positive, but um, the magnitude is a little bit lower. And that's, um, I think, very consistent with the way humans actually um, use caffeine and consistent with the NHANES data in terms of where that daily level of uh, caffeine intake winds up for most of the population. So um, what are the implications of caffeine and, and how it affects behavior? Um, I think humans not only use caffeine to um, get what um, most of us would uh, think were positive effects, but some may use caffeine to get some negative effects. Um, most consumers um, choose caffeine, choose to use caffeine in moderate doses um, and have characteristic um, and regular patterns of intake. Um, but adverse events, adverse uh, moods, if you will, can occur um, at high doses, you'll see um, some increased anxiety and some jitteriness. Um, but um, there's some suspicion that um, when those, uh, when individuals use caffeine at those higher levels, they're actually purposely trying to create those kinds of um, changes and um, the population that um, would be most likely to do that would be uh, young males. So, um, there are many reasons for consuming caffeine. Um, some are social, some are biological. But why is caffeine's um, ad libitum intake so consistent over time in spite of um, all these changes in um, society, including product choice, social norms, and availability? Um, I think the answer may be that humans are very good at modulating their mood state and um, knowing how much caffeine they've consumed and how it's going to affect them and they um, titrate the dose so um, they produce the um, optimal cognitive effect. Um, and I would argue that um, that mark, that tracks back to the physiology in that um, by um, setting that up dose of caffeine for you, you're in the um, uh, optimal zone of uh, antagonism of adenosine receptors. 
So to sum up, um, caffeine's behavioral effects um, are produced by blocking central adenosine receptors. Caffeine is consumed in moderate doses by most of the U.S. adult population. Uh, the current uh, mean estimated intake over the whole 2001 to 2012 period for the whole population is about uh, 183 milligrams of caffeine per day. Um, it doesn't appear that caffeine intake has increased over the last 12 years, um, and it may not even have increased over the last 40 years. And of course, coffee contains, uh, continues to be the primary source of caffeine in the diet, providing more than uh, 50% of caffeine intake um, by all age groups. Thank you. If there's a, a burning question, we'll take it. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll, there will be time throughout the, the, the session to ask questions. Yes, thanks, Richard. Uh, burning and quick. Um, I'm still not clear on caffeine intake for kids. When I looked at the charts, I thought it was 19 to 30 bracket. And so what I'm specifically trying to understand is, is caffeine consumption energy drinks going up for kids in the range of 12 to 15? We did not look at that data. There have been other groups uh, that have. And I'm not um, familiar enough with their findings give you a definitive answer, but I think that's in the, I think that's in the literature at this point. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Craig Llewellyn, the Coca-Cola Company. Um, Harris, great, great talk, wonderful. Uh, one of the dichotomies you presented was the language from the FDA around just the aspect you presented last around the regulating that intake and how intake appears to be self-regulating and hasn't increased and that they, they appear to have uh, a lack of confidence in the evidence. Is any thoughts on why they have a lack of evidence and where we may go from that? When you lack, lack of evidence with regard to? The, the, uh, the self-titration aspect. The, well, I don't think there have been um, particularly good experiments to demonstrate, I know there has been some work, to demonstrate that in fact in a, in a situation where you would, for example, um, give individuals um, products which are identical but have different levels of caffeine, um, that they actually would titrate it the way um, they do naturally. So, you know, we can see that in the real world, but you kind of have to do an experiment to prove that um, it happens, and that's the way it happens. 